Hi, I'm Angie. Hi, I'm Sarah. We're the winners of the Jubilee Sweepstakes. Hope you enjoy this video. The, the specific thing of doing it to a child that has no say is, is something I kind of... The same way about. as becoming a Jew. We have no say. Yeah, but becoming a Jew doesn't necessarily mean doing something to uh, <laughs> your private parts. Step forward if you agree. Jewish men should be circumcised. This is part of my relationship with God. But I don't understand why the rest of the world would do it. I do it because God says, this is my relationship with you. Do this and I will be your God forever. When God says to me, circumcise your son at eight days, I do it because that is what Jews do. I remember hearing a story of a woman who was on a transport to Auschwitz. She had just given birth to a baby boy. And while she was marching, she asked someone for a knife. And the German soldier mocked her and said, you want to make your, you know, you want to bring an end to your life easy, sooner? And apparently she took the knife, circumcised her son, with the comment so that he should die a Jew. These types of images create such burning metaphors that our families, our grandparents, will sacrifice their lives under horrible conditions to be able to maintain that, that commandment of circumcision. For 3,800 years, we Jews have done this. It's only been in the last maybe 20 years that people are starting to say, well, do we have to do it? The moment you stop physically doing the covenant and the religious things, assimilation comes in. Can the disagree or step forward? I just didn't feel it was appropriate for me to talk about this because this is specifically a man issue. I'm circumcised and, and it's never been, you know, an issue for me. Like, I'm never like, oh, I wish I wasn't circumcised. It, you know, it's whatever. It, I don't remember it. So I have, I guess, some qualms with it about doing that to a baby when they have no say. Obviously, if you're an adult and you want to do it, more power to you, go for it. But the specific thing of doing it to a child that has no say is, is something I kind of... The same way about. as becoming a Jew. We have no say. Yeah, but becoming a Jew doesn't necessarily mean doing something to uh, <laughs> your private parts. This is what God wants. This was the first thing that our father Abraham was told by God to do. When God first asked us to do it, yes, Abraham, who then could say, yes, all right, I will do that. But he would have done it at eight days also, but God didn't bring it up until he was 99. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Rabbi Chaim Mintz. I am on the Orthodox side. I don't believe there's a God. I don't believe in Judaism. Belief means that I accept it because you say so. I know there's a God. I know my Judaism is real. This is the way God created me. This is my purpose. I'm ooze in Judaism. Whether you recognize it or not, this is who I am. I don't uh, uh, really believe in a lot of the religious aspects of being Jewish, but I do love to celebrate, celebrate the holidays with my family. It's so, sort of more of a state of being to me than uh, something I uh, actually do. Women and men have separate roles in society. Not necessarily that we're not equal in a certain way, but especially when it comes to Judaism, a woman historically has always been on a higher spiritual level than men. We are the ones that instill the values, the holiness, the culture. We are very strongly a part of the community. And it's important that I'm saying this because these little TV shows that come out, they like to paint the whole situation as if Orthodox Jewish women are second class citizens and they just want to leave the community and it's so hard for them to exist and they have no say and no life. And it's not true. I don't go around saying, well, we're totally equal in all areas. I have different responsibilities when I pray because my, like you said, my soul needs greater rectification to reach holiness, whereas my wife's soul, it's a local call. For me, it's a long distance call, <laughs> but we have different roles. I want to feel equal in all aspects of Judaism, and all you have to do is go to the Kotel in Jerusalem, 
and take a step back and look at where the mechitza is, where the divider is between men and women at the wall. And the men have three quarters of the wall, the women have a quarter, and you know, we're, we're all packed in there. And I wanted to have my time to touch the hotel and pray. And I'm trying to, you know, have that moment. And it was really hard to not have that moment when I was there. God did create a male female for a purpose. If he wanted us all to be the same way of practice, then we would have been exactly the same. God created six other genders as well, which are also in the Torah. We'll get to that. We'll get to that in a moment. God says, I don't trust men because women are holier. I've heard that, that narrative a lot of how women are holier. I think the biggest thing for me is if a woman wants to wear a kippah or a talus, to, she feels like it makes her closer to God. Why should she not be allowed to do that? I think that's my biggest issue. Add that to your kosher. Add that to the mikvah. In every religious home, the woman is seriously on a pedestal. In theory, that sounds, that sounds good, but I think in practice, men are, you know, praying a certain way uh, to, to feel closer to God, and when women want to do that, they are told they can't. I just want to step in for a second. I want to say, even though I do believe what I believe, I still believe that if people want to do something, they have the right to do so, and I'm not going to judge them for it. I would only marry a Jewish person. I married somebody Jewish, and I wouldn't have thought of going out with anyone else because marriage is not about love. I'm here to build the next generation of Jewish people. I'm on a mission as a Jew to keep Judaism alive. Marrying a, a Jew is of paramount importance to me, primarily because I see what happens to many intermarried couples down the, down the road, where I see the fights that creep up come Christmas, Hanukkah time. Statistically, the, the divorce rate is so high in this country. So why go into a relationship where you have statistical uh, obstacles to prevent you from ultimately having a healthy marriage? Because I grew up in a reformed synagogue, we're very accepting of different interfaith families and things like that. I mean, definitely is possible, but again, in all different walks of life, different sects of Judaism, it's so different. So the, the couples that you are aware of that were successful in their intermarriage, what happened to their children? And specifically, were the mothers Jewish or not? If the mothers were not Jewish, under Jewish law, the kids are not Jewish. The couples I know are still together. Some of them, the mother's Jewish. Some of them, the father's Jewish. There are more progressive values coming up that say that, you know, if your father's Jewish, we'll still accept you into the community because we want as many Jews into the community as possible. Obviously, not always successful, but I have seen those successful circumstances for sure. I'm Ali. Uh, I'm here as a secular Jew and I identify as a reformed Jew. I have dated a non-Jewish person once or twice and it's something that my parents didn't love and I actually kept one parts of it a secret for a little bit. This is the one area where it's really important for them to, for me to end up with a Jewish partner because again, raising Jewish families and celebrating holidays together, it just minimizes conflict. I just find a lot of connection with other Jewish people. Just being Jewish isn't enough for me to, to mean, oh, well, that's someone I, I, I want to spend my life with. My dad, uh, who's, who's Jewish, uh, when, they, when he started dating my mom and when he married her, they were, uh, my mom was raised Christian and she wasn't Jewish. She did convert later. They married, they, it, was, it was an interfaith couple for like a couple of years. Every person who I've dated or who's ever loved me has not been Jewish. And I'm mainly attracted to people who aren't Jewish because I grew up Jewish. I'm Yoana, like Moana. My pronouns are she, they. I'm 20, and I am a secular Jew. My family was Orthodox. I feel judged by Orthodox Jews a lot because I'm queer presenting. I found it very restricting. Now being the kind of Jew that I get to be, it's a lot more freeing. I get to be me. I support Israel in its conflict with Palestine. Israel deserves to exist. Israel is our ancestral homeland. Also, Jewish liberation doesn't have to come at the cost of Palestinians losing their, their freedom. So in that sense, I don't agree with the last part of it. 
However, the conflict is a different situation. Like you were saying, it shouldn't have to come at the expense of Palestinians. There is a conflict going on right there right now. What's true for us is different than what's true for other people. And we should just be able to live in peace. I know we want that. I think blind support for anything is problematic. Yes. I'm Canadian. Do I support every action the Canadian government takes? No. Mm -hmm. Do I support Canada? Of course. Okay, I'm going to say something that's most probably going to explode this entire conversation. 1947, there was no such thing as Palestinian people. They were Jordanians or Egyptian citizens. In 1948, these Jordanian and Egyptian citizens were told by their people, go into refugee camps, we'll wipe out the Jewish people, and you'll move back. In 1964, Yasser Arafat came out and said, I am going to raise up a people and call them the Palestinians because we are going to liberate Palestine from the Jews. The question was, do I support the conflict between Israel and Palestine? I really don't because the Palestine never existed. My issue with it is that you just don't see them as a people, but Why? that's no, not- No, 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 I didn't say that's the what Jordanian, it sounds like. Why didn't the Jordanians take them in? Why didn't the Egyptians take in their citizens? I, I don't know why that happened, but regardless, that, a Palestinian peoplehood was created and we can't take that away. But, terrorist, but terrorism comes from it. Terrorism can come from anywhere. We have it in our own country. I'd like to comment, you know, I'm a little sick and tired of the rhetoric where American Jews have to apologize with this proviso by saying, uh, the, Israel has a right to defend itself. Israel has a right to exist. You don't hear that language anywhere. No, no proud uh, citizen of any country says America has the right to exist. England has the right to exist. Do I have to justify it? Do I have to bend over backwards to gain the recognition and the acceptance of those who are sitting there like this judging me? I won't. There's always this binary terminology also that's used that's very destructive. There is, are you pro-Palestinian or pro-Israel? Or pro Why is it one or the other? But this is the terminology that they use when they are only describing Israel. They don't say, are you pro-China or pro-Korea? I want to support Israel. I love, I love Israel. I want to love it. I want Israel to be a safe place, a safe haven for, you know, Jews and people of all you know, religions and backgrounds. I'm not saying that I am against Israel, totally pro-Palestinian. I'm just saying that there are things, like you said, that, that Israel does that I, uh, in regards to the Palestinian conflict, that I don't agree with at all. I mean, what you were saying about uh, there being no Palestine before, you know, 1924, there may not have been a Palestine in the country, but there was a burgeoning and growing Palestinian movement and a Palestinian identity since growing around 64, those people. Since 64. There's, that's not entirely true. Look at there's, your history. There, I, I have looked at the history. There was, I mean, there's a little disagreement on when exactly it started, but there has been a movement among the people, the Arab people in that area to, to create I, a... Because the King of Jordan did not want them anymore in his neighborhood. And the, and the people of Egypt said, we don't want these people I don't think it matters why. I, think, I, don't think it, I don't think it matters why it happened. It just matters that it happened. Israel is not causing them to suffer. That's, that's not entirely true. You show me one, one policy of Israel that makes Israel, uh, that makes the people of these areas suffer. The settlements, when they, when they appropriate land from uh, the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and then they, they make the settlements, and they make roads and bridges and transportation that Israeli citizens can use, but the Palestinians cannot use. It Fantastic argument. Fantastic. You're right. So what was the problem before the settlements? The problem before what was the, the problem? Why was there why, why was it rioting? Before? Why was it terrorism before the settlements? What there the why was there a massacre in Hebron before the state of Israel was created? Nineteen twenty-seven. Why did the Arabs I'm not saying there was no. I am not saying that there is no no groups of Palestinians that have never right, done so anything I'm just saying wrong. You can't take a case out of them in a vacuum. I wanted to share with you that when Israel is being attacked, let's assume at the UN, and everyone's coming after Israel, and Israel feels very isolated. I just want you to imagine what Israelis feel like when they hear American Jews being critical of them at that moment. When they're feeling so down, they want their brothers and sisters in America to support them. And when you don't, you have to understand that there's a psychological toll that they feel. And I share that feeling when I see my fellow American Jews not supporting our brothers and sisters in Israel. You defend your family. If my brother or sister did some, it committed a crime, was on death row, I would support them emotionally, but I would hope I would still be, have the bravery to say what you did was wrong. I have ancestors who died in the Holocaust.
on my grandmother's side. My grandmother's mother, I'm pretty sure had about seven or eight siblings that um, could have been my future like great aunts and uncles who I never got to meet. Well, growing up in New York, I didn't know anyone who had a full set of grandparents. Pretty much everyone was a second generation Holocaust survivor. I know that my mother was from uh, Chernovitz, Romania. She was transported to a concentration camp called Transnistria, where the Germans and the local ruffians took great pleasure in uh, beating up and killing Jews. And just as recently over this past Shabbos, I learned my great grandmother and my grandfather's sister perished at Babi Yar, where the Nazis would line somebody up on a ravine and shoot and they would fall into a, into a trap. So the Holocaust has uh, very much scarred my psyche. In fact, many times I would even fantasize and think that maybe I'm a, maybe I'm a reincarnation of someone that died in a concentration camp in a, in a gas chamber because I have such vivid images etched into my mind because it, it burns deeply within me. What I noticed about the world, we call them Holocaust survivors, the children of Holocaust survivors. I, in my synagogue, use a different word. I call them the rebuilders because the way the Jewish nation was in Europe, we, we were not wealthy. We weren't, you know, we were living in huts. We had small schools. We don't take this kind of things lightly. We rebuild. So I look at that generation, just about all the Holocaust people that came out. They said, how are we, how are we going to rebuild? You brought up how your mom was in the Holocaust. When she came out, what was the first thing that she wanted to carry on? Have babies, have a Jewish family, make up for the loss that Hitler uh, destroyed. Her children were my mother's revenge, believe it or not, her vindication. I believe that I carry the blood of my ancestors in me, that I have an added obligation to bring honor to their memories who have been perished, and to maintain the faith that they so staunchly uh, defended. So it's not just some footnote in the past, but I believe I, I'm, I'm an ambassador of their values. Jewish people benefit from white privilege. Okay. <laughs> America has been playing games where they decided the Irish are now white, the yeah. Italians yeah, are exactly. now white, but 200 yeah. years ago they were not. Um, I was like eight or nine or something and I was in shul and I'll never forget, like there were these girls that would always play with this ball. One day I walked up to them and I was like, hey, can I please, like, uh, like whatever, I, I want to play with you. And they were like, oh no, your hands are dirty. I was like, no, look, my hands are clean, my hands are clean, you know, and I checked and I see, and then the girls laughed at me and they were like, ha ha ha, the dirt's all over you. And they said, you're black and dirty. And they laughed and then they went, they ran away. And I was just standing there like, what does that mean? Every day I woke, I went to sleep. I woke up, I'm like, please Hashem, make me lighter. Make me lighter like my sister so that they'll like me better. I just had this ingrown hatred for my own blackness because of what someone else said. And it also led to moments of me not even wanting to be religious anymore. Well, I disagree with the premise that there is a white privilege to begin with. Um, I don't think in my grandparents' generation in America, when they were denied jobs because they couldn't work on Shabbos, so they didn't have any white privilege. When Jews were not allowed into various law firms, I don't see any white privilege there. Growing up in Queens, New York, having my face kicked in by the local ruffians, I think it is a myth. I am not saying that there isn't racism unfair treatment to minorities in this country. I'm well aware of it and I litigate it all the time. If I took off my Jewish jewelry, no one would bat an eye. I live my life as a proud Jew because I want people to recognize my Jewishness and I don't want anyone to find out after the fact and have maybe regretted hiring me or, you know, things like that. But again, it's recognizing the fact that I pass as a white person in my life. It's, yeah. it's hard to recognize what you don't experience. I think part of it is it's sort of like white privilege doesn't mean you don't have hardships or have struggles or, or can have terrible things happen to you. It just means that in America currently, struggles that are hardships that you go through, white people don't go through them because they're white. They go through them for a myriad of other reasons. Mm -hmm. you know, I grew up in Crown Heights where I was a minority. My parents were very poor. I was given a trip by my uncle to come down to Florida in the 60s. It was the first time I ever saw 
we do not serve blacks, dogs, and Jews, and I was on the bottom of the, of the level. I want this country to be what Martin Luther King said, you shall be judged, not by the color of your skin, but by your actions. If we in America have a problem keeping to that message and constantly saying what Martin Luther King said, then we're off topic. There's a thing in America called redlining. It has maintained the division between diff diff different ethnic groups in America ever since the Civil Rights Act was passed. And what that means is that if you live in a certain zip code and you are from a certain race or ethnic group, you cannot get a loan, you cannot get a mortgage, you cannot move out of there. And why aren't there and laws to prevent this? The, why aren't the, why aren't the redlining limits? are the laws that were created to make this happen. So, so like, let's, so let's let me, make let America a better place. You're from Crown Heights. You should know redlining exists there. Excuse me? You should know redlining. There is no redlining. Redlining in, in, exists in, in, in there. Crown and let Heights. me and let me explain this to you. Redlining maintains and creates anti-Semitism and anti-blackness. How we that were works. Together. I, I grew up there. How that works. I, I played let, basketball. Please, let, please, 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 please let her finish. Please, please let her finish. Yeah. Please let her finish. She's using my hood. That's why I'm. Yeah, okay. well, also okay. mine. That's where I was hood. born. So the Crown Heights that I grew up in was rough and tumble, yes. But when there was the rioting, I got to tell you something. There was a black man sitting in front of my porch. I don't know why, but he was my neighbor and he didn't want me to get hurt. And I got to tell you something. We embraced, we loved, we had dinner together. The Crown Heights I grew up in was humanity. What does it mean to be a Jewish person in USA? Being a Jewish person in America today means consistently dealing with anti-Semitism and never seeing any repercussions for it, which is why I believe that it is more important ever to be proud of being a Jew in spite of the spikes in anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism? has increased in the U.S. in recent years. Uh, I agree, especially uh, where I'm from in Brooklyn. I kind of grew up seeing anti-Semitism, especially even though I was a child. I like the first, my first experience with it was, of course, the riots. And if you were Orthodox, you felt it because you were identified, you're like an identifiable Jew, but if you weren't, you didn't know what was going on. And now it's so out of control that even people who don't look Orthodox experience it daily. So yeah. Yeah, it's I mean, I run a Jewish Instagram page and when you look up Jewish on Instagram, mine is one of the first thing that comes up. So of course we invite the trolls and the anti-Semites. And there was this one instance where these two 13 year old boys were commenting all over my post saying, I wish your grandparents died in the ovens. I agreed with Hitler. You know, these are two 13 year old boys. Where did they learn this? Because of social media, people can hide behind the screen, people can hide, and they don't have to, in your face. I used, for years, I had a radio show on KFI radio here in LA. <clears throat> and then from time to time, somebody would call in and say, I'm not an anti-Semite, but. Yeah, yeah. The moment they said that I'm not an anti-Semite, it but. says, let me recorrect you. You're an anti-Jew. If we took the word anti-Semite out and say, no, you're anti-Jew. Do you know how hard it is for them to defend themselves? Anti-Semite's a cool word. It's not so bad. I'm just an anti-Semite. You know, I never thought about it like that. You know what? You're so you right. You know, no, what you're saying, like, this is also something very new that we're doing that's, that, that started yeah. on, on so social right. media as well. In the past year, what some people who are definitely anti-Jewish would say is, how can I be anti-Semitic? I'm a Semite. I'm a Semite. I'm, I'm so a we exactly. started how using, we yeah. Yeah. Started, yeah, exactly. You're anti-Jew. So what yeah. we started, yeah, so the terminology that we have been deciding to use now moving forward is anti-Jew hatred. We are God's chosen people. People always talk about Jerusalem being like the holy city. And I always tell people, um, you know, I was born in Jerusalem, so that makes me a holy bitch. <laughs> 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 We're chosen, but our, our purpose in this world, because some people misinterpret it as privilege or that yeah. we think we're better than people. No, mm -hmm. our purpose in this world is to be a light to the world. Let's get to the crux of what chosen really means. When God created Adam and Eve, God gave them a religion. The religion was seven commandments to live by. When the world was destroyed because the world wasn't living by these seven, God came to Abraham and says, I'm choosing you and your children to do 613 
commandments. So what does it mean really to be chosen? I got a bigger job for you. Christians believe that only Christians go to heaven and everyone else goes to hell. Jews don't believe that. So when we say we're the chosen people, we're not saying that we're the only ones that are good enough to go to heaven. Like you're saying, we just have more, you know, a bigger job to do. When I see a uh, general in an army with all of his medals on his lapel, and I keep thinking about how proud he is to be a member of his army, and he wears his medals with pride. I keep thinking, as a Jew, I wear my medals with pride. And uh, what comes to mind in response to the prompt is the prayer that we say on the holidays. I'll say it in Hebrew, and then I'll translate it in English. You chose us above all nations. You love us and you desire us. And you raised us up above all other nations. There's a love affair between God and the Jewish people. I think it's very, very important that we maintain our pride. We wear our medals with pride. We don't apologize for who we are. And we do the best that we can. I'm going to say it was a pleasure exposing the Jewish community to yeah. the world. <laughs> How beautiful it is when everyone can sit together and talk. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to this channel for more videos.